I'm really excited to uh, to talk to everyone today. It's it's a, a little strange. We'll we'll have a question and answer session at the end, um, but I do have. I, I would be remiss if I didn't start off with a couple of dad jokes, since uh, dad jokes are something that I, I, I put into the book a bit. Um, so, why is there such a long line at the cemetery? Because people are dying to get in. Sorry about that. I, I have two more. You know, I got fired from my job at the cemetery yesterday. I made a grave mistake. And as you can tell, I'm never going to get a job as a comedian. And the last one is, why are cemeteries so noisy? Because of all the coffin. Sorry, I love that one. Okay. Anyway, I'm gonna um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to hopefully, if I can get this to play here. Uh, I, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of cemeteries uh, from kind of the the early days of the colonies in the United States up to the present day. So starting with really Jamestown and then working our way up to. Um, I guess current times in the age of the the electronic uh, cemetery known as Facebook. So before I start, I'm gonna just go kind of halfway in between there, and rewind uh, to Tombstone, Arizona, and I'll tell a, a, a brief a story about that. Back around 1880, this was the boom time of Tombstone, Arizona. That is the uh, actual picture of modern Tombstone, uh, the, the the restored buildings. The, from the 1880s. Um, but back then it was a silver town and uh, things were booming. And just on the outskirts of town was a Wells Fargo outpost where there was a clerk named uh, Lester Moore. He was uh, working at Wells Fargo and uh, the uh, one day a, a scoundrel walked in and tried to rob the Wells Fargo. And Lester was carrying his own six shooter and he was resistant to hand over the loot from the Wells Fargo to uh, the bandit. And so the bandit pulled out a gun, fired four shots, bang, 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 bang. And then Lester Moore had lifted his gun, bang, and shot one as well. And the scoundrel went down, but sadly, so did Lester Moore. He was buried on a quiet spot uh, in the Boot Hill graveyard, which the old Western cemeteries at that time were called Boot Hills because people died such sudden and violent deaths, they were said to be buried with their boots on. And because they were so accustomed to death, because death was such a companion in these old Western towns, they often had uh, kind of uh, dark humor for the, uh, for the tombstones. And for Lester Moore's, his was, here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. So like I said, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the short, happy life of American cemeteries as we know it and their uncertain future. Uh, Boot Hill Graveyard accepted permanent residence only for five years, and it filled up with several hundred graves. You can see the background. It was just, it's this gorgeous place on the outskirts of Boot Hill, or, uh, of, of Tombstone, rather. And so when you drive into Tombstone, this is kind of the first tourist site that you see. But uh, as I said, we'll be talking about where the bodies are buried, or um, another way of putting it is the tombs, they are a change in. Uh, what America's cemeteries reveal about us the good, the bad, and the ugly. Cemeteries in a lot of ways are dying uh, these days because they are running out of money, we are running out of space, and also because the uh, preferences for cremation and other methods for our mortal remains are, are being chosen. So uh, really, I decided to write about this because I was really fascinated by this idea of cemeteries and what they hold and what we lose if we lose cemeteries. So I'll, I'll give you a little history on, on how I began, how my cemetery journey began. And it really was uh, at Shawshin Cemetery in Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, just outside of Boston, when I was a uh, going into my senior year of college, just before that, during the summer, I worked for my town department of public works. And 
I would, uh, one of the jobs that I had was to mow the cemetery, Shashin Cemetery, which was established in 1849, and also to uh, occasionally dig graves. And this was like no job I had ever had prior to this. Um, I'm sure that that is a relatively uncommon summer job to be digging graves. But what really fascinated me the most was the mowing part, because I would spend hour upon hour within Shashin Cemetery, and the place came alive to me. I would, it, it told so many different stories, right? It, not just about the individuals who were buried there. And those stories were interesting in themselves, just by looking at the dates and the data there. But it also told me about the history of the town itself, the economics, the changing social styles, the wars, the pandemics, uh, the good times and bad times that the cemetery had. And the cemetery itself, the even the landscape of it changed by the different eras. And it was just so fascinating to me as I looked and saw the names of families who I had heard of in the history of the town, all the way up to the names of families who I knew then. And ever since then, I've had this interest in cemeteries because every cemetery has its own unique individual story about that place. But cemeteries themselves tell a story about America. And Cemeteries and their architecture and their styles and what's how how we have treated the dead has changed over the, the the centuries. So how we buried the dead a century ago is different from now. Is different from two hundred years ago. It will be different from a hundred years from now. So over the course of these recent decades, I've managed to find different ways to go to different cemeteries and. Oftentimes it's during family vacations and dragging the family along, my wife and kids. And unfortunately, they don't quite celebrate my fascination or share my fascination for cemeteries because clearly they're the weirdos. Um, about seven years ago, I started reading about cemeteries and how they were running out of space. Uh, and I never really thought about the idea of cemeteries going extinct. Um, first of all, we, we just don't have enough space in the country to perpetually have and preserve burial grounds. But then also, when burial grounds fill up, they lose their source of revenue. And from there, it can become difficult for cemeteries to stay in business or to, to have the funds to maintain or even hold on to the property. There are some really well-organized cemeteries that have perpetual funds that really take them long into the future, but they also have to be very aggressive about how they raise money and how they, um, I guess, lure people into the cemetery, lure the living into the cemetery. And so I decided to start really researching and perhaps even writing a book about it. Uh, and the more I researched, the more fascinated I became about just the history of cemeteries themselves. They, they were no longer just these places to visit, but um, they became this fascination, this, this kind of anthropological fascination to me in a lot of respects. Now, here are cemeteries from the 1600s when I say that, that cemeteries are changing. This is uh, Salem, Massachusetts, right? And then when you look at the 1800s, this is Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York uh, from 1838. You can see how 200 years later, cemeteries are quite uh, different. And then 2023, you can see the cemeteries of today. Oh, that's Facebook, but I'm getting too far ahead of myself. So I'll get back to this notion that cemeteries um, are, uh, let me just, scroll back a little bit. Uh, we're not the only ones who bury our dead. Elephants do it, ants do it, um, but we're the only ones who leave grave markers. Right here, this is a 13,000 year old, what's really considered the first, uh, first place that we've discovered where people intentionally buried and memorialized the dead. Um, and this is Rakefet Cave on uh, Mount Carmel, Israel. It's also, you should know, where the first fermented drinks, the first place where alcohol was created. 
Uh, so that kind of ties together a tradition from my own Irish American family of equating the dead with alcohol. Um, it's good to see that that has continued. So that cave was the first place where we we know for sure that that Homo sapiens buried and memorialized the dead. In the United States, in North America, the oldest intentionally buried remains that we found date back 12,700 years ago in Montana. And uh, it was, the remains were found in a farm field uh, and the DNA from the remains of this young boy who was found uh, is one that is shared by, it is believed, 80% of indigenous people living today in the Americas from Canada all the way to the southern tip of South America, which is just immensely fascinating. Um, the burials that took place in North America before European colonists came over were as varied as the people who lived across the country. One common, commonly shared type of burial were scaffold burials, where you would uh, bury the dead uh, up high and the remains would stay there for a few years and animals, birds would kind of take away parts of the body and return the body to nature in that way. So why a hole in the ground? Uh, the Greeks and Romans, uh, they, they anth anthropologists will tell you that um, most cultures have a tradition of burial. We know that the Greeks and Romans said that by planting people in the ground, it got them closer, it got the, the dead closer to the underworld, but <clears throat> there were practical reasons as well. Cremation takes a lot of wood. Uh, so for a typical cremation, it's about a thousand pounds of wood. We think about uh, like the, the Odyssey and the Iliad or the Iliad really and the, and the funeral pyres, but that would have taken a lot of trees to cremate all of the people who, um, you know, from that era. And, uh, and in places where there weren't a lot of trees, it just, there was just no physical way of doing that. So burials were a lot more popular than people realized. You can see in the, the picture there, uh, uh, you know, a, a Viking ship and uh, sending it out to sea uh, uh, and, and lighting it on fire with the body of a, a deceased warrior. That, that would be, um, pretty that that would be pretty tea, tree intensive if they did that uh uh with every person so the first um european burial grounds uh in the uh in europe uh, the first european burial grounds in europe sorry the first kind of the first burial grounds in europe that we think about today were largely ones that were attached to uh to churchyards houses of worship um but then once uh people came to the United States, what is today the United States, it was, uh, the, the burial traditions changed quite a bit. <clears throat> it, at Jamestown and Plymouth, people, the, the, the groups of people who settled there, uh, their burials were mostly very hasty and uh, the graves were shallow. They didn't mark any of the graves and there were, there was no pageantry. There were no coffins. There were no, um, uh, really anything to show where people were buried. And the, and the reason was for a number, there were, there were a couple of uh, kind of primary reasons. One was that uh, the, they just didn't want any of the neighbors to know the casualty count uh, for the, the first settlement in Plymouth and the first settlement at Jamestown. And also they just didn't have the time or energy to dedicate to, to burying people. In fact, in um, Jamestown, it was uh, immensely uncivilized compared to the, the, the ornate and sacred burial traditions of the indigenous peoples that had lived around where Jamestown was. And it's believed, in fact, it's, it's known from digging up some of the, <clears throat> the graves that are at Jamestown that the Jamestown settlers actually uh, originally when they dug up some of the graves of the fresh dead and resorted to cannibalism uh, in order to survive. 
when you get to the 1800s, the burial traditions uh, had changed quite a bit. At this time, there still were, to, to get a gravestone was something that was rare and um, really burial grounds were still a part of mostly houses of worship. And this is the, the, the Trinity Church of Burial Ground in New York City. And it's believed that 120,000 bodies were buried beneath about 100 grave markers. And at this time, cities were becoming basically the, the burial grounds were becoming overfilled to the point where they were these just terrible health hazards. Uh, the, the ooze from the dead were uh, polluting the water and uh, the smell from these overfilled burial grounds were uh, believed, people believed that the miasma from them were spreading disease. And so there, during the, the 19th century, there was this massive movement towards burial reform, which created, uh, which led to the creation of cemeteries that were removed from the, the, the churchyards and were standalone. And these places were these dedicated burial grounds became known as cemeteries so that they had like this fancy name uh, and in order to recruit people to buy plots that were up just outside of the city limits in Boston and in Brooklyn and places like this. And it was they were really the first city parks and the first examples of uh, landscape architecture uh, where grounds were sculpted and designed to be aesthetically appealing. And so when the first uh, rural cemeteries, as they were called, opened up, thousands and thousands of people visited it. Greenwood Cemetery, when it opened in the 1830s in Brooklyn, became the country's second largest tourist attraction besides Niagara Falls. And then I'll move forward a little bit. And you can see here the importance that um, gravestones uh, started to take. This is uh, obviously at Monticello uh, in um, Virginia, and it's uh, which was Thomas Jefferson's uh, plantation. And you'll notice the symbolic uh, importance that Jefferson realized that a cemetery and a grave marker took. He says here his he wrote this epitaph himself, and he designed not only the spot where the graveyard would be, his family cemetery. Uh, in Monticello, uh, but he designed the actual gravestone. And of course he knew that people would see this graveyard for centuries to come. And he wanted to be remembered in a certain way. So he said, you know, here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom and father of the University of Virginia. But what is uh, striking and ironic about Thomas Jefferson is that he appeared to go to great lengths to hide where the enslaved people's burial ground was at Monticello. So Thomas Jefferson was this meticulous record keeper to the point where he would, he, he, he tracked spools of cloth that were used for clothing and everything down to the minutest detail, but nowhere in any of his minute records does he mention the burial ground, the location of it, or anything about the burial ground for the hundreds of enslaved people who died on his plantation. And it was only in the 21st century that one of the uh, burial grounds was discovered. And it's, not just Jefferson who through his kind of intentional um, masking or erasure of uh, a enslaved person's burial ground on a plantation property. He wasn't the only person to do that. That was a common thing uh, throughout plantations in the South. And it really gets to the notion that the people who went to these lengths to hide where the bodies were buried had a very 
morally clear sense that what they were doing was an abomination and they did not want to be remembered for it. And they did not want the evidence of this crime against humanity to be shown. Um, you can see now, this is it's kind of ironic, that's uh, Jefferson's grave. And it in the family cemetery um, there on Monticello, it's, it's locked behind gates. And you can see the padlock there as well. This is a photo of a Greenwood Cemetery, which I had mentioned before, which became one of the most popular cemeteries in the country. It became kind of this... Uh, blueprint this for, for other rural style cemeteries across the country. During the middle of the 19th century, the city of New York closed down uh, all cemeteries that were basically below um, it was something like 72nd Street or something like that. And eventually all burials except for and one cemetery were closed off in Manhattan. So the residents of Manhattan were looking for other places to be buried. And Greenwood today is just this gorgeous place that really draws people in through its art, uh, through the artwork of its gravestones. And you can see the architecture of the, entry, the Gothic entryway there. Uh, Greenwood was not only the first city park, but it was also the first public art museum uh, in the country. It was, it was the first city park in New York, uh, and it was the first public art museum in the country. And people were so inspired, basically the uh, people from Manhattan were so inspired by this amazing piece of landscape architecture that they decided, wouldn't it be great to have a central park in Manhattan without the gravestones? Uh, and that's essentially how the idea for Central Park uh, came about, which is really kind of the first major city park that was created with without graves. Um, and then I'll move forward to the Civil War, which was a huge turning point for cemeteries in America. At this point, people were still, uh, death was still a very personal thing uh, in a family's home, it took place. Usually someone died and they were surrounded by their family. They died in what was called the death room, uh, which was later changed in the 1920s to the living room uh, because it, it, it sounds better. Um, I, I'm glad that I can watch football now on Sundays in the, the living room as opposed to the death room, but I'm a Patriots fan. So right now it's the death room. But, um, and family members carried the their loved one to the local burial ground in a gen, generally in a pine box that was made by the local cabinet maker who also made um, coffins and the person was buried basically very naturally the civil war changed things and it was a lot of it had to do with um, people trying to process the mass death that was occurring in the case of Union soldiers, they were fighting for this just cause, but it was believed because they didn't die the good death, having their last words recorded in front of family uh, and everything like that. They were dying these anonymous deaths that perhaps they were not reaching salvation, regardless of what the cause was. And American public sentiment was starting to turn against the war. So... Lincoln decided he never, he almost never left the Capitol. He decided to go to Gettysburg National Cemetery shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg. This was one of the first national cemeteries that was created. And he gave the Gettysburg Address there during the consecration of that cemetery. It was designed to be in the mold of a rural cemetery like Greenwood or Mount Auburn, which was the first one in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so it's just this gorgeous place. And he tried to convince people that the American public, that the soldiers who died at Gettysburg and were buried at Gettysburg National Cemetery had died the good death. And so he said, we, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. He's saying, because the people who died there did that. And so it really changed the perception of what the good death was and what it meant 
to die for your country. Lincoln played a huge role in that. Uh, Lincoln had another role in how the change, the radical changing attitudes of death uh, in the United States. With the death of Elmer Ellsworth, he was the first casualty, the first Union casualty uh, in the Civil War. And he was a former aide of Lincoln's. And in order to celebrate his life, um, Lincoln ordered his body to be embalmed, which was uh, embalming at this time was, it had been done by the ancient Egyptians, but it was starting to be experimented upon the modern form of embalming by um, physicians in Europe and then the United States in order to preserve cadavers for medical schools. Uh, and so Lincoln had Elmer Ellsworth embalmed, and then he went on this, this showing tour from Washington, D.C. up to New York, where thousands and thousands and thousands of people would come to see Elmer Ellsworth's body. And uh, it really became a popular thing. People wanted to have their loved ones embalmed. Lincoln himself uh, was embalmed. And he, Lincoln, during the Civil War, um, set aside funding so that officers' bodies could be embalmed and then sent to their loved ones back home. Uh, and so this cottage industry of embalming uh, really arose from there, where embalmers would circle around a battlefield site before the battle even took place and uh, sell their services to people going off to fight into battle. Or in some cases, embalmers would even, um, they would embalm someone's body and hold on to it and then kind of hold it until for ransom until a, a family would pay for the body, the embalming, and then have the body uh, shipped home. And that's really where the, the modern uh, method of embalming in the United States comes from. The United States is still one of the few countries in the world where embalming is a, is a part of the burial traditions. And uh, it basically, it, it only is a tradition in a few English speaking countries. Uh, and it really started after the Civil War. But then when the Civil War, or during the Civil War and then afterwards, because when the Civil War ended, all of these uh, funeral specialists turned their eyes towards the American public and selling these same wares, selling these same strategies to um, and services uh, to the American public. And that's how the American public started to be involved too. And there was this, there began this shift from being um, memorialized and remembered and shown in someone's living room or death room at that time to, or also called the parlor to an actual offsite funeral parlor. And the cabinet makers became undertakers, became funeral home directors who then offered embalming services as well. And it really was part of this movement that, that really removed death from the home and into funeral homes and funeral parlors uh, across the country. Um, this is Arlington National Cemetery, this just gorgeous place. Another national cemetery that arose. Uh, one of the most beautiful cemeteries. I love this place. Um, what's fascinating about uh, Arlington, there's, there's so many stories behind Arlington, whether it's Kennedy's uh, eternal flame or just the, the original creation of the cemetery, which was on Robert E. Lee's property. And it was established there because Robert E. Lee's property overlooked uh, Washington, D.C. on a bluff uh, across the Potomac. So the strategic vantage point was really important for the Union to capture. When they captured his property, they buried uh, bodies around the house and around uh, Mrs. Lee's rose garden so that uh, no one could ever live there again because it was it was uh, Robert E. Lee's fa favorite place in the world. And um, then this larger cemetery grew up out of this spot, basically as a giant uh, middle finger uh, to the Confederacy. And then uh, as time passed, it really became this Elysian Fields, this this kind of with all this neoclassical architecture 
as a way to recruit Americans almost to want to fight and die for their country. So uh, there is a um, amphitheater within Arlington National Cemetery that's very neoclassical looking. And every year the president speaks there on Memorial Day. And one of the, uh, one of the arches, above one of the arches is, is a saying in Greek, is a saying in Latin rather, and it comes, it was a quote by Horace. It says, Dulce et decorum est pro patria more. And it, it says, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. But that's also, some of you might realize it's it's the name of a Wilfred Owen poem from World War I. Wilfred Owen was, a, was an English poet who uh, died a week before the armistice from on the battlefield. And he wrote a poem as he was recovering from injuries during, a prior battle uh, and hit from his poem, Dolce et Decorum Est, he wrote, it was a very anti-war poem. Uh, and it said, if you could hear at every jolt, the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, Dolce et Decorum Est, pro patria more. And to those who have been to war, who go and see Arlington National Cemetery and see the words Dolce et decorum est pro patria more above this archway, which is supposed to glorify death for one's country, um, you know, you can't help but also think of the irony of those words in the context of Wilfred Owen's poem. But um, I could go on and on about, about Arlington. This right here is Laurel Grove Cemetery. And I'm kind of going forward in time, right? With each of these cemeteries based on, on, on when they were established. And this was established shortly uh, after the Civil War. And it really gets to the heart of segregation in cemeteries in the South. Uh, something that continues to this day, in fact, there is at, at Laurel Grove in Savannah, Georgia, there is a black side to the cemetery and, and, and a white side. And the white side is full, but the segregated black side is still a, a living cemetery that accepts uh, burials today. Um, this statue right here is uh, called Silence and the torch is turned upside down as if somehow liberty were overturned. It's it's stands above Confederate graves. Um, and Laurel Grove South is in the very 19th century tradition of rural cemeteries. And a great deal of money is still spent by the city of Savannah to keep it up today. It's this really gorgeous place. But then when you go to the African-American side, which is separated from the white cemetery, by an interstate that was built in the 1960s, you can see that the city doesn't spend nearly the same amount of resources on this part of the cemetery, which is gorgeous in its in a, kind of its spare elegance and, and beauty. Uh, and the stories that this part of the cemetery has to tell are absolutely remarkable. But you can't help when you go to both sides of the cemetery to see the striking distant difference. You can see the entryway to the white portion of the cemetery that, um, and, and how the city maintains it with this incredible, beautiful uh, entryway. And then the map of Laurel Grove you see there, that was put up in 1998. And it tells, if you can see on the picture, it says map of Laurel Grove Cemetery. And it, it shows, Basically, it identifies every single burial site on Laurel Grove. But if you look closely, actually, it doesn't. It only, this was built in 1998 by the Friends of the Laurel Grove Cemetery. It only, it only includes, includes, includes the map of the white side of the cemetery. The black cemetery is to the left of that line, which is the interstate, and it's just left blank. And that was 1998. And even to this day, it hasn't been changed. Um, so we move into the 20th century 
and burial traditions start to change a little bit, they had been monetized by uh, the Civil War and the, the growth of capitalism into cemeteries very much uh, expanded during the 20th century. There was a cemetery that was established in the early 20th century called Forest Lawn Memorial Park, which uh, is right outside of, um, well, it's in Los Angeles now, but it, at the time it was it was built on not not really this this great piece of property just outside of uh, Los Angeles in in Glendale, and the founder's name was Hubert Eaton, and he was this genius at monetizing death. And so he created uh, this place where really it celebrated, what he tried to do was celebrate uh, life and eternity. And he uh, pioneered methods like pre-selling graves and um, having an all-in-one cemetery. He buried all of, he, he embedded all um all gravestones into the ground so that all you could see was grass because he basically designed it to look like a country club. He also um, became, he also started to name the different sections to, uh, to appeal to different people. So there was a lullaby land and a, and a veil of memory and an, uh, an, uh, an eventide section and he, every, it really became this very Disneyland-like place. Uh, even today, when you go there, there are no trash cans that you can see until you look. There are these tree stumps or faux tree stumps that are where uh, trash cans are buried. And music is piped in from speakers hidden in the trees. And it's, he, he turned it into what really became the first amusement park in the country. And amusement park uh, or theme park rather amusement parks are places where there are rides and uh, uh but theme parks are places of amusement that are based around a specific theme and in this case it was kind of the everlasting afterlife and so along with uh reshaping the grounds of the cemetery that he created he also um brought in all of these amazing works of art and he commissioned all these amazing works of art. So the people would go there like it was a museum in a lot of respects and they would walk through the um, the the gift shop and buy gifts and postcards and everything. It was an incredibly Disney-like place. There's a, um, you can see the builder's creed here where uh, he, he, he gives his uh, over on the right where he explains what kind of a place that he wanted to create. And it would be one that was um, basically a place that would be overflowing in celebration of God and the flag. And then he says at the end, and, and also it would be a profitable place. And notice how familiar lullaby land looked over there. Uh, it, it looks very Disney-like. But remember too, that this was opened 50 years before Disneyland. It became the number one for almost five decades, the number one tourist attraction in the United, in California until Disneyland. And Disney himself is buried there now. In fact, uh, the layout of Disney was actually inspired by uh, this uh, cemetery. If you can see here, this is the Wee Kirk of the Heather Chapel that is at the cemetery. And Ronald Reagan was actually married uh, in that uh, Wee Kirk of the Heather. And if you look at the old Associated Press articles and other news articles, it doesn't mention anything about that he, the fact that he was married at a cemetery. It just says he was married at Wee Kirk of the Heather, but notice, the similarity between that and the uh, cottage from the Disney film, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He found, uh, the, the founder Hubert Eaton found this uh, novel way of pre-selling graves where he would actually have salespeople go to people's homes and sell them on everlasting life through buying cemetery plots. 
Uh, eventually, it, this turned into burial insurance, which then turned into life insurance in the United States. Um, there's a poem from uh, Natasha Trethaway uh, where she uh, writes about how this, this family uh, in the middle of the 20th century, they, um, they, they could never own anything this, uh, in, in life, but they bought a burial plot and it was the one piece of property they would own upon death. And so I'll read some of that. It says, Saturday morning, Motown 45s and thick 78s on the phonograph, window fans turning light into our rooms. We clean house to a spiral groove, sorting through our dailiness, wash tubs of boiled white linens, lima beans soaking green as luck, trash heaped out back for burning, everything we can't keep, make new with, a th with thread or glue, Beside the stove, a picture calendar of the seasons, daily scripture, compliments of the Everlast Interment Company, one day each month marked in red, premium due, collection visit from the insurance man, his black suits worn to a shine. In our living room, he'll put out photos of our tiny plot, show us the slight eastward slope, all the flowers in bloom now, how neat the shrubs are trimmed, and see here, the trees we planted are coming up fine. We look out for him all day, listen for the turn stop of wheels and rocks crunching underfoot. Mama leafs through the Bible for our payment card, June 1969, the month he'll stamp paid in bright green letters, putting us one step closer to what we'll own, something to last, patch of earth, view of sky. You can see the marketing that he put into getting people to buy into Forest Lawn and it became this immensely profitable place. But 20th century California also became the birthplace of cremation in the United States to a large degree. It actually started in, in Pennsylvania, but the monetization, the uh, mass marketing, the, uh, the, the, the massive growth and popularity of uh, cremation really occurred in California and at the Chapel of the Chimes uh, in Oakland. To this point, up before the Chapel of the Chimes, Cremation in, in the early 20th century, cremation was seen as something that was godless, uh, that was something that atheists did. The Catholic Church uh, was dead set against uh, cremations. And so uh, this architect named Julia Morgan, who was the architect of Hearst Castle and was this amazing architect who's largely unappreciated uh, who was largely unappreciated until recent years, um, was commissioned to create in the 1920s, the Chapel of the Chimes, uh, which would be a crematorium, but then also a place that would hold cremated remains. And she created a crematorium, a place, uh, a, a place for the holding of cremated remains to look and feel holy. Uh, there are pages from the Gutenberg Bible that are on display inside the Chapel of the Chimes. It looks like a monastery from medieval times. And the urns aren't these ancient Greek shape uh, like vases. The urns are actually shaped like books that fit on shelves within the Chapel of the Chimes to make it look like uh, books from a monk's library. Uh, and you go there and it's this immensely, profoundly gorgeous place. Uh, and this is really, not only was it the place that kind of changed the perception of the act of cremation, uh, but also it monetized creation in a lot of respect in, in, in ways that are still uh, used today. Um, you can see here the shelves that carry the books and just how gorgeous this place is. So let's get to modern times and this uh, movement towards natural cemeteries. Natural cemeteries basically take us back to the original way that Europeans, when they came over to the United States, were buried. Uh, you're buried in a shroud oftentimes or in a wooden casket. Uh, there's no grave marker. Uh, the area itself then goes back to nature and there's no embalming or other chemicals that are used. And as people have gone towards 
cremation and away from burial to the point where now more than 50% of the country is cremated uh, as opposed to buried and, and cremations are going up. People are trying to find other ways uh, to, to secure an eternal resting place. And one of the increasingly popular ways is through natural burials. This is the Nature Sanctuary uh, Burial Ground, which is a part of West Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia, which was uh, one of the classic rural cemeteries. And it uh, is on a kind of reclaimed landfill spot that the cemetery had that will then eventually go back to forest. You can see there are no grave markers uh, within the burial sites themselves, but the names of the people buried there are on the uh, the markers that you see above the stone wall there, um, the granite markers alongside uh, the burial place. And this is considered one of the, if not the greenest uh, burial ground uh, in the United States. But there are a couple of reasons why people are looking for alternatives to the traditional cemeteries as we think of it. First is environmental, of course, but cremation is not a perfect solution there. It is the equivalent to cremate one body is the equivalent of driving uh, a couple thousand miles, some people say, uh, in a car as far as the carbon footprint. Um, and then also people are not as attached to a certain place anymore. We're much more mobile uh, in where we live. And so having that one burial ground where grandma and great grandma and everyone are buried isn't quite the same anymore. And it's difficult for people to go and visit loved ones. So uh, it's really changed people's perceptions on burial and cemeteries. And of course, social media has as well. If a um, cemetery is a place where people want to store the data of their life and have their life story told. There are other places now that can hold on to that data at a much greater level. It can show the pictures from someone's life. It can show the, it can record the voice and videos. It, it records the story arc of people's lives in a lot of respects and captures it. So digital immortality is something that kind of has overtaken the notion of being buried in a burial ground. If um, you think of cem a cemetery as a place that captures the essence of who someone is, then Facebook is the largest cemetery in the world. Right now, more than 30 million members of its, uh, or sub of Facebook, 30 million members of Facebook have passed away. And it's believed that within 50 years, there will be more dead people who are on Facebook than the living. But what's also kind of scary about having all this data with social media companies is that there are different ways to monetize the likeness, the voice, the everything of the dead. There are companies now that are trying to create um, AI powered avatars of the no longer living so that if you give enough data to them, you can talk to the AI version of grandma or um, someday your descendants will be able to talk to the AI version of you, which gets into a whole host of ethical and moral and, and other issues. But uh, that's kind of where we are today.